in a move that's got the aviation world buzzing. US Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has recently given the U-2 Dragon Lady spy plane a nudge closer to retirement. This legendary aircraft, surviving countless attempts to ground it, might finally be hanging up its wings for good. The US Air Force isn't just twiddling its thumbs either, they're reshaping their whole arsenal to tackle the fierce battles of tomorrow head on. But what's next? What mystery aircraft will fill the shoes of the venerable U-2? Will it bring new tricks to the table or leave some gaping holes in the defences of the United States? For now, the Dragon Lady continues to soar through the skies, doing what she does best. But the future? That's still up in the air. It instilled in the free nations, and let none doubt this, the unshakable conviction that as long as there persists a threat to freedom, they must, at any cost, remain armed, strong and ready for the risk of war. In the early 1950s, the Cold War was starting to feel a bit hot under the collar, and the US military desired better strategic aerial reconnaissance to help determine Soviet capabilities and intentions, and to prevent being caught off guard, as it had been in the attack on Pearl Harbor during the Second World War. Enter the legendary aircraft designer Kelly Johnson and Lockheed's famous Skunk Works team, the wizards behind some of the most iconic fly machines known to man. At the time, these aircraft included the twin-engine, turbo-supercharged P-38 Lightning, America's first jet fighter, the P-80 Shooting Star, and the fearsome F-104 Starfighter. As part of a top-secret project funded by the CIA, they would also go on to design and develop what would later be known as the U-2. Nicknamed Dragon Lady in homage to its CIA development code, the stage was set for what was to become one of the most renowned aircraft of the 20th century. Developed as a reconnaissance aircraft and designed for flying at extremely high altitudes, the U-2 completed its maiden flight over the desolate expanse of Groom Lake, Nevada on the 1st of August 1955. The test area, synonymous with all things mysterious and covert, is better known today as Area 51. After entering service in 1956, the U-2 went on to become the undisputed Queen of the Skies, capable of cruising at jaw-dropping altitudes, reaching a staggering 70,000 feet. It soared where no other aircraft could dream of, scooping up intel far beyond the known reach of Soviet radar, fighters and missiles. However, the 1st of May 1960 would prove to be educational for the U-2 program, as it was the day the aircraft shot to stardom, and it shot there faster than the Soviet surface-to-air missile that was about to shoot it down. Captain Francis Gary Powers was at the controls on a CIA mission when his U-2 got into a tussle with Soviet air defences and was subsequently shot down over their turf. Powers parachuted to the ground and was captured, and overnight, the U-2 was catapulted from clandestine hero to global superstar, faster than you could say, national security breach. But that wasn't the U-2's only claim to fame. It also had its camera lens firmly fixed on the action in Cuba in 1962, snapping shots that laid bare Soviet nuclear ambitions in the region, sparking the Cuban Missile Crisis and sending shockwaves across the globe. And Get this, there was even a version that was modified for US Navy carrier ops. Talk about versatility. By the late 60s, it became clear that more U-2s were needed, leading to the much improved second generation U-2R in 1967. This updated variant had an airframe that was 30% larger and was a far more capable platform than those that had gone before it. From the jungles of Vietnam to the sands of Iraq and the mountains of Afghanistan, the U-2 ruled the roost, keeping watch over some of the world's most critical hotspots. But despite all the fame and glory, since 1955, across all types, they have only churned out a measly 104 of these aircraft. During this time, the primary users have consistently been the US Air Force, and as mentioned, the CIA also had a hand in employing the U-2 for spying purposes. Interestingly, there is another entity that operates the U-2, but we'll get to that later. 
Fast forward to 2023 and the U-2 returned to the headlines once again when one flew over the Chinese surveillance balloon that was cruising over the US. The cocky U-2 pilot decided to photobomb the party and the Pentagon posted a snapshot from the cockpit just to rub it in before the balloon got a taste of American hospitality courtesy of an F-22 Raptor. Today's U-2s live at Beale Air Force Base, California, as part of the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing. The U-2 also holidays on operational detachments worldwide, including RAF Fairford in the UK, RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus, and Osan Air Base in South Korea. The current aircraft in use entered service back in the 1980s, with the final one delivered in 1989. Despite the fleet's average age now pushing 40 years old and the Air Force facing diminishing manufacturing sources for key parts, these iconic aircraft are still in regular use and flying high. To this day there's nothing quite like them, they are the last of their breed. As a result of the U-2's unique design, it is still the highest flying manned military aircraft in service today. With upgrades to modern sensors and communication hardware, a new engine that's more powerful and fuel efficient, weather penetrating sensors that capture data both night and day, and new avionics using multifunction display panels. Today's U-2 fleet continues to prowl the skies as the Air Force's only manned high altitude intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance platform, providing situational awareness, alerting friendly forces on the ground, monitoring airspace for potential threats and pinpointing areas that pose a danger to the US and its allies. For those of you wanting to know more about the general characteristics of the latest U-2, now is your chance to hit pause and review more information on this incredible aircraft. Commonly referred to as the most difficult aircraft in the world to fly, the U-2 Dragon Lady has been host to less than 1500 pilots since its first flight in 1955. By comparison, there are already more than 1,500 pilots rated to fly the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II, which first flew in 2006. Setting aside its pilots for a moment, when it comes to keeping the U-2 airborne, it's a job that'll test the mettle of even the most seasoned maintainers. But fear not, because there's a crack team of dedicated ground crew at Beale Air Force Base that make sure these old dragons continue to fly. Now, you'd think they'd grumble about babysitting a relic from the past, but no. Some of the maintainers, with a twinkle in their eye, refer to the U-2 as a blast from the past, a term of endearment for this high-altitude wonder. It's a marvel of contradictions, a technological masterpiece strapped to an airframe that can trace its roots all the way back to the 1950s. Think about it, while fifth generation aircraft such as the F-35 Lightning II are all slick and digital, the U-2, it's like stepping back in time. None of that fancy fly-by-wire nonsense here, oh no, it's all about good old fashioned cables and pulleys, just like the Wright brothers used to do it. And so, without this dedicated crew, the U-2 would be nothing but a museum piece. As for the human component, when it finally comes to getting a U-2 pilot ready for action, it's a job which falls to the life support technicians, another part of the unseen network of professionals behind every mission. The team, including doctors and support crew, are often the first faces the pilots see when they arrive, and the last ones they see when they are buckled into the U-2's cockpit before a mission. Now let's talk flight gear. We're not talking about your everyday flight suits here, we're talking full pressure suits essentially modified spacesuits designed to keep the pilots safe. They face extraordinary risks flying the U-2, not just due to their extreme altitude, but also because their cockpits are only partially pressurized. In fact, the pressure in a U-2 cockpit at typical mission altitude matches that at 29,000 feet, a height rival in the summit of Mount Everest. To combat this, U-2 pilots don their pressure suits and breathe pure oxygen for an hour prior to takeoff. This pre-breathing regime helps purge nitrogen from their bodies. It's a sobering thought knowing that if any nitrogen remains, their blood and tissues could essentially boil in flight. On a brighter note, the pilot does get 19 in-flight meals to choose from. That's right, you heard me. From hearty entrees to sweet desserts, they have plenty of options. Apparently the hash browns with bacon is a favourite amongst U2 flyers. With a typical U2 flight lasting in excess of 8 hours, Prepping a pilot is quite the undertaking. 
but when it comes to ensuring mission success and the safe return of both pilots and aircraft, there's absolutely no margin for error. When it's finally time to fly the U-2, unsurprisingly it's not just a one-person show. Every mission has a primary pilot as well as a secondary pilot on standby. Other than the two-seater training aircraft, operational U-2s only have room for one, and so the second pilot serves as a backup in case the primary becomes ill or can't fly for some reason. But their role doesn't stop there. The second pilot is also responsible for some of the aircraft configuration before takeoff, as well as conducting the pre-flight walk-around inspection, since the primary pilot is suited up and can't do it themselves. Plus, they provide crucial support in case of emergencies. Essentially, when it's time for the pilot to hop into the cockpit, the aircraft is ready to roll. They trust that everything's ship-shape as they're buckled in before firing up the engine and getting on with the sortie. When it's time to bring the U-2 back down to earth, the wingman steps in once again, this time driving the chase vehicle and talking the pilot down from 10 feet in the air and onto the runway. But landing this beast isn't easy. It's like trying to bring down a glider that's dead set on staying airborne. With extremely limited visibility and landing gear as narrow as a skateboard, it's a nerve-wracking descent. One wrong move and it could all go wrong. And after hours in the air with exhaustion setting in, this is where the wingman's extra set of eyes make all the difference. In the high stakes world of U2 flying, this symphony of teamwork and expertise has forged a tight knit community at Beale Air Force Base. Outside of performing the roles that most of us have come to associate with the U2, it's worth mentioning some of the Dragon Lady's other assignments. This includes working with the Department of Agriculture to collect photos of crop and land management, and when Mother Nature throws a curveball, the recon of disaster areas affected by floods, earthquakes and wildfires. NASA has also been in on the action, and since 1971 they have been using the U-2 in different configurations to collect science data. It currently operates two U-2 variants in the form of ER-2 High Altitude Airborne Science Aircraft, which are used for a wide variety of environmental science, atmospheric sampling and satellite data verification missions. Testament to its versatility and endurance, even after the U-2 is officially retired from the US Air Force, it is likely that NASA will continue to fly the aircraft in its ER-2 configuration. In a 2015 report, the US Air Force dropped a bombshell. Since 1994, they'd pumped a staggering $1.7 billion into modernization upgrades for the U-2. Further to this, in 2024, the boffins over at Lockheed Martin, the manufacturer, stated that the old girl still has a whopping 75% of service life still in the tank. This equates to a potential 40 plus years, stretching all the way to 2064. If the US Air Force was to keep the U-2 flying for that long, we'd be looking at a mind-blowing 109 years of active service. But let's be real here, as exciting as that sounds, it's probably not going to happen, at least not in the Air Force. Why, I hear you ask? 
Well, it all boils down to one simple truth. The U2 might be young at heart, but it's starting to show its age when compared to the world around it, especially when it comes to air defences. Even those operated by smaller players would now give it a run for its money, let alone the big dogs like China or Russia. In a heavyweight showdown, there's a real risk that the U2's effectiveness and the aircraft itself would take a serious hit. Some have argued that it might as well be flying with a target on its back. And so, despite Lockheed's claims about the U-2's future potential, it seems that the US Air Force is forging ahead with its plan to phase out the aircraft by 2026. This means that if everything goes according to schedule, it will have notched up over 70 years of operational service. That's quite a remarkable career for the Dragon Lady, considering she first graced the skies over Groom Lake way back in 1955. As for what comes next, the Department of the Air Force faces significant challenges as it readers itself for potential conflicts, particularly with peer adversaries like China. To stay ahead of the curve, they're gearing up for a major overhaul, restructuring forces and shifting towards space-based sensors for some serious high-altitude surveillance. And if the rumours swirling around are to be believed, there's a new kid on the block, the mysterious Northrop Grumman RQ-180. This classified drone is said to be stealthy, high-flying, and already in action. But here's the tough part. Making room for these shiny new toys means bidding farewell to some old favourites, including the loyal and trusty U2. While the transition promises new gadgets with enhanced capabilities, the retirement of the U-2 would come with some significant trade-offs. Unlike unmanned assets, the U-2 offers unparalleled flexibility and versatility, especially during peacetime, where it excels as the ultimate high-flying, strategic intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance truck. Despite operational costs and pilot training expenses, the U-2's continued relevance cannot be discounted. Ideally, it would coexist alongside newer technologies, at least until any capability gaps can be addressed. However, this would require a substantial financial commitment from the Air Force, and unfortunately, that money appears to be earmarked for other endeavours. In the meantime, the U-2 is pulling double duty as a testbed for cutting-edge reconnaissance and communication tech. It's paving the way for more sophisticated drones and beefing up data sharing capabilities through initiatives like the Advanced Battle Management System. And so the U-2 soldiers on, a beacon of tradition in a world hurtling towards digital domination. It's a symbol of resilience, straddling the line between old school grit and cutting edge technology. Yet, in an increasingly digitized landscape, the days of the analog U-2 appear to be numbered marking the end of an era in aerial reconnaissance.